just to say thanks for checking in everyone and welcome. Um, wonderful to see lots of familiar and new faces. For those of you who have joined before, you have a sense of our, of our flow, um, but we have a, a conversation format with Sharon and Parker, and we invite you to add questions in the chat as we go. Um, this conversation today will be up to 90 minutes and we'll, we'll see where the conversation takes us. So we'd love to get started. Um, Aaron, anything before we do? I think that's great. Over to you, Claire. Wonderful. Well, today's session is um, the journey towards an undivided life. And we'd love to invite you, Sharon, to kick us off with an opening meditation. Um, perhaps you can help us quiet the mind and begin to hear um, our deepest longings. Over to you, Sharon. Well, thank you so much. It's, it's a great delight to be with all of you. It's always a tremendous honor and delight to be with Parker. So um, I'm very happy about, about this whole series. Uh, I just wanna say that a quiet mind in my understanding doesn't mean there are no thoughts. So if that's something you're hoping for, it's probably futile. So, and it's not necessary. As one of my teachers said, it's not the thoughts that are the problem, it's the glue. So what we're gonna to try to do is create enough space so that we can see the thoughts come and go. And in that space, we have options. Do I wanna take this to heart? Do I wanna let this go? <laughs> and so um, please don't feel badly if you have tons of thoughts and if they're, they're not all beautiful and wonderful, it's, it's all fine. Okay, so let's sit together. If you wanna sit comfortably, however that is for you, close your eyes or not, however you feel most at ease. You can start just by listening to sound, whether it's the sound of my voice or other sounds. Unless you're responsible for responding to the sound, see if you can just have it wash through you. Of course, we like certain sounds and we don't like others, but we don't have to chase after them to hold on or push away. Just let them come, let them go. And bring your attention to the feeling of your body sitting, whatever sensations you discover. See if you can feel the earth supporting you. Feel space touching you. Usually we think about touching space and we think about like picking up our finger and poking it in the air. But space is already touching us. It's always touching us. And we can just move into a kind of receptive mode. And bring your attention to the feeling of your breath, just the normal natural breath wherever you feel it most distinctly. Maybe that's the nostrils or the chest or the abdomen. You can find that place, bring your attention there and just rest. See if you can feel one breath without concern for what's already gone by, without leaning forward for even the very next breath, just this one. And as thoughts come and go, emotions come and go, sensations come and go, 
See if you can allow them to arise and pass away. You don't have to follow after anything. You don't have to fight it. You're resting. Your attention and the feeling of the breath. And if something really like picks you up and carries you away, you get lost in thought, spun out in a fantasy, you fall asleep, truly don't worry about it. See if you can realize you've been gone, you've been distracted, gently let go. And with kindness toward yourself, return your attention to the feeling of the breath. And as you're observing all of these thoughts and feelings arising and passing away, you might ask yourself this question. What do I need in order to feel whole, in order to feel complete? And just see what comes up as a response. If something very specific comes up, I'd urge you to look deeper. Maybe you thought, I need, a, I need a romantic relationship in order to feel complete. But what is it we actually want? Maybe we want a feeling of security. We want to feel that we're special. We want to be remembered. There's something underlying it that may take many forms. And so see if you can come to that level. What's the longing? What's the yearning? You might think I need a lot of money, but really no one wants a pile of bills anywhere or coins or, or whatever. We want what it represents to us. Security, leisure, relief, anything. And just recognize those feelings and stay with them. And perhaps in response to that question, the answer comes, I don't need anything else in order to feel complete, in order to feel whole and rest in that feeling for a little while. What's that like? And again, simply sit, resting your attention on the feeling of the breath, allowing whatever arises to arise and pass away. And when you feel ready, you can open your eyes or lift your gaze and we'll end the meditation.
Thank you, Sharon. Thank you. As we move into conversation, um, Sharon, could you tell us about how you started your inner journey, some of the early steps you took, um, reflecting back over the years, what emerges for you? Uh, well, many things. Um, I just had an anniversary, which is kind of eerie. I've, I've been meditating for 50 years, or like, as my friend said, way before it got to be cool. So um, I, I went to India as a college student, especially to learn meditation. And that was because I had taken an Asian philosophy course in college. And um, honestly, when I look back at that course, it was kind of happenstance. I, I had a philosophy requirement. It was convenient for my schedule. I thought, I'll do it, that one, it's on Tuesday. Um, and there were a couple of things that were life-changing about what I heard in that class. One was uh, when they were talking about the Buddha, and they talked about the Buddha's really unafraid, unashamed acknowledgement of suffering in life. And I, like many people, had had a lot of trauma, a lot of loss in my childhood. And like for many people, I had a family system where this was never ever spoken about. And so I didn't know what to do with those feelings inside that were very real. And um, I think hearing the Buddha tells us talk about suffering as an inevitable and natural part of life was the first time I actually felt I belonged, that I wasn't on the outside. It wasn't weird, it wasn't different, that this is a part of life. And I realized that the acknowledgement of that could be the bridge to one another that we could actually feel a, a part of a whole. And, and that was enormous for me. And then I heard in the context of that class, there were methods, there were practices that some people did called meditation. And if you practice meditation, you could be a lot happier. So I was going to college in Buffalo, New York and upstate New York. And I looked around Buffalo in like 1970, I did not see it anywhere. And I, so I created an independent study project. I said to the university, I want to go to India and learn how to meditate. And they said, okay. So off I went. Um, and I, I want to say one thing about longing and about yearning. Uh, well, I want to say two things. One is I think about that moment a lot where I decided to go for it. Mm. I was 18 years old. I'd never even been to California before. And I decided I was going to go to India. And there's something extraordinary about that moment. That's why I think about it all these years later, where I thought, I'm not just staying on the margins. I'm going to see what can be real for me. I'm going to breathe life into this instead of thinking, well, it's for other people, or maybe I'll do a graduate school program in it someday, or I'll, you know, I'll think about it some more. Uh, and that's an extraordinary moment, I think, for any of us when we kind of move into the center of possibility. And the other thing is actually a story where um, just before I left Buffalo for India, a Tibetan teacher named um, Trungpa Rinpoche came to Buffalo. This is his first trip to the United States. And he gave a talk at another, another college and they asked for written questions as a talk. And so I wrote out a question and I said, my friends and I are leaving in like four days for India to study meditation. We don't know where to go. What, what, where should we go? And he had like this big pile of questions in front of him and he pulled it out and he read it out loud. And then he said, I think you had perhaps best follow the pretense of accident. And that was it. It was like no addresses, no handy monastery guidebook. Mm -hmm. I think you had perhaps best follow the pretense of accident. And that's exactly the way it happened. Um, you know, I went to India, I started out um, in Dharamsala where the Dalai Lama lived. I heard he was, you know, Buddhist. I thought I could learn meditation there. And uh, it was just one of those situations that didn't work. I'd go to the, the class and the teacher I had to go to the dentist, which is at the other end of India. So that was two weeks, you know, it was just not working. And then I overheard a conversation at a restaurant about an international Hatha yoga conference that was going to be happening in New Delhi. So I went there thinking, oh, I'll, I'll find 
a teacher in a way to actually meditate because I was I was only interested in the how to you know I wasn't really interested in the philosophy I wanted the kind of straight stuff this is how you do it and I thought I'll find a teacher there and that was a really dismal experience where the low point was when these yogis and swamis were up on the stage pushing and shoving against each other to be the first to grab the microphone and speak and I thought well this is hopeless but then actually Dan Goldman, who we all know, you know, all these years later is the author of Emotional Intelligence, somehow was delivering a lecture at that conference. And he mentioned he was on his way to this town called Bodhgaya, where he was going to do this intensive, like immersion course in meditation, which sounded like exactly what I was looking for, just the how to do it. And I thought that's it. And it was it. And I say all that because I realized that what I had through all the ups and downs and uncertainty and seeming futility was that yearning, that there was something within me that just knew I shouldn't give up, that it may come in a form very unexpected to what I had imagined, but uh, I had to keep going. And, and so something about coming close to that and acknowledging at that and letting it lead us in some way, I think is very important. Thank you, Sharon. Parker, uh, the title for today's session is An Undivided Life. And this is something that you've spent um, close to a lifetime uh, developing and working on and reflecting on. And I was wondering if we could invite you to share with us uh, some of your thoughts um, and teaching uh, on this. Well, thanks, Aaron, and, and thank you, Sharon. It's uh, just a joy to be back working with Sharon. She always asks such great questions and teaches me things that I need to know. And it's wonderful to be part of this community. Uh, talk about the pretense of accident. That's, that's how all this happened for me. And I'm grateful. Um, the wonderful question Sharon asked us a few minutes ago is, what do I need to feel complete, whole? What do I need to feel complete, whole? And I want to say that for me, one of the things I've always needed is insight, understanding. Um, Sharon founded the Insight Meditation Society. What was it, 40 years ago now? 45 years ago on Valentine's Day. 45 years ago. So uh, celebration coming up soon. Um, and and insight for me, framing my life journey in a way that gives me a little bit of an x-ray vision into it is, is, is a powerful tool of wholeness, completeness, in part because it allows me to integrate my brokenness into my sense of wholeness. Uh, what I need is some understanding of how that brokenness arose, what it has to teach me, how I can embrace it as part of my wholeness rather than trying to run away from it. So I want to offer just a little schema here about our journey uh, from a divided life to living divided no more, which isn't a journey that you make once and for all. It's one you take again and again and again. Um, like being an anti-racist, it's a daily decision. Uh, all of these decisions about human wholeness are daily decisions. We don't get there and then rest. And I'm going to run this through four stages, starting with the obvious point, where, when we are born. So we're, we're born integral, whole. We're, we're born in the shape of an authentic human being. It's, it's why I and a lot of other people love being around infants and little kids. They remind us of what a human being is supposed to look like. And, and part of that reminder, part of that wholeness is that whatever is on the inside of an infant or a little child comes immediately to the outside, both figuratively and literally. Um, every parent of young children knows this. Um, Emotionally, what that means is that a kid can experience rage in one moment and joy the next and turn a, on a dime, uh, freely and fully expressing herself or himself in the outer world. There's, there's no governor in there saying, 
I better hold back on this feeling because they're, they're not going to like me as much if I let it go. There's none of, none of these obstacles that get in our way as adults. So the question for me becomes, where do those obstacles come from? That takes us to stage two. What we, what we do, what we learn to do, and sadly, some kids learn it at home, but a lot of us learn it in school. If we grew up in a safe environment, the school poses the, the lack of safety that causes us to build a wall between our inner and outer lives. So suddenly we find ourselves with, with an onstage life and a backstage life. So this simple Quaker PowerPoint will illustrate what I mean. Uh, that's on stage. This is backstage. It's richer. It's deeper. It's full of thoughts and feelings, intuitions, ideas. And out here is our onstage performance. So backstage, onstage. And what we're trying to do on stage is to stay safe. And we're asking a lot of ego questions. Um, am, I, am I doing well enough to belong and to be accepted? How do I look while I'm doing it? Uh, questions that can remain with us for a very long time in life. And it's, it's all because we find a need to, to build this wall of separation between true self and public self. Um, it's like torn tissue. It creates pain. But we accept that pain because it's a, it's a trade-off for, for safety. And I, I noticed that Sharon several times in her meditation mentioned words like security or safety. We, that's a basic question that we're all asking all the time. And when you're a child, you don't have the resources to think deeply into something like meditation. Uh, you, you do whatever you're able to do what's available at the moment. And what's available for a lot of us is hiding out. Um, as, as many of you on this call will know, there are millions of people in the LGBTQ plus community who can tell a very vivid story about what it means to not be able to show up in public as you are and who you are. Uh, in, at a younger age, but all of us have some version of that, which haunts us for a long time to come. And sadly, our educational system builds that wall of separation higher, wider, and thicker, or so it seems to me. Um, I went all the way through a PhD, and nobody in my schooling was ever interested to ask me, what's going on inside of you, Parker? Can I help you reflect on that? You know, in, in the intellectual tradition in which I stand, it's as if nobody was interested anymore in Socrates' statement that the unexamined life is not worth living. Because they certainly didn't help me examine my life. That had to come at a later date. Um, it had to come really through pain. Uh, the, the pain of feeling that, as Thomas Merton once said, I was living a life of self-impersonation. That, that's a phrase from Merton that I think about a lot. Most people live lives of self-impersonation. And so we impersonate on the public side of our lives, whatever we think is worthy, even noble about what's backstage, but we don't, we don't let the whole thing out, but the pain gets to a point for some people that, that that walled life is not tolerable anymore. And they take a step toward personal liberation, toward authenticity, identity, integrity in public life, which involves taking that, that wall and pulling it into the classic shape of a circle with the inner life and the outer life still there. But now the, the question becomes, and this is a word from, 
from decades, uh, centuries of spiritual literature, how can I center my life on that which is important? How can I take what I most value and hold as true on the inside and use it as a plumb line around which my outer life revolves with some degree of fidelity? How can I use my inner truth as a plumb line to around which to organize, to array my words and my actions. Well, that's a step forward. And I don't, I don't mean to dismiss or put down all the literature on centering. But if you turn that, that image, this is one of the reasons I like physical images. If you turn it a little, it stops being the perfect circle and it starts looking more like a gated community or a walled garden. A, a fancier way of keeping the world out, but it's still keeping the world out. And there's a tendency in that divide, this form of the divided life. There's a tendency for a person to say, you can come inside this gated community or walled garden, if and only if you believe as I do, you think as I do, you speak as I understand, et cetera, et cetera. It, it becomes an exclusionary principle, and it's, it's not uncommon in spiritual and religious communities. In fact, I think devolved forms of spirituality and religion are some of the primary sources of this kind of pleasant form of the divided life, which is actually a, a disengagement with the world that somehow people find acceptable because it's spiritual. One of the things I love about Sharon's approach to meditation is that it takes us from the inside back to the outside. And that's the next step in this four step scheme of mine from birth to the divided life, to the to life lived in the walled community. The next step is to create this interesting form called the Mobius strip. Some of you will know this form. Um, it's a form well known among mathematicians, where what you do is you take that strip of paper, you separate one end from the other, and you give it a half twist and then rejoin the ends. And what's really interesting about the Mobius strip is that it's a it's a three-dimensional object that has only one side. There is no inner and outer divide here in the Mobius strip. If you put your finger on what appears to be the outside and keep tracing it around, you eventually come to what appears to be the inside. And if you keep tracing that around, you eventually come back onto what appears to be the outside. You, ha you have to keep saying what appears to be the inside or what appears to be the outside. Because as I said, this is a one-sided object. And, and the, key, the key point of it is that the inner and the outer in the Mobius strip keep co-creating each other as they move around that, that interesting mathematical form. When I first saw that, I thought, well, that's exactly what life is like, isn't it? Um, we, we have an inner life to be sure, but there is no way for it not to move into the outer world and help co-create that world. And we have an outer life to be sure, but there is no way for that life to not come back inside us and keep co-creating who we are. So we and the world are constantly co-creating each other in exactly the way suggested by this Mobius strip. The inner and the outer are not two different things. They are a mutual process of co-creation that never stops. They, they go on while we sleep, they go on when we're awake. To put it plainly, a lot depends in, in terms of my role in the co-creation of the world, 
a lot depends on what parts of my inner life I am willing to put out into the outer world. Am I going to be stingy about that and put out only the parts that make me invulnerable or appear to be invulnerable? Or am I going to be generous about it and put out the parts that are tender in me, that are vulnerable in me? Not because I'm a masochist, but because maybe someone else needs a witness to the fact that human vulnerability is an important ingredient of life and you can not only survive it, you can thrive from it. You can thrive from being vulnerable about hard experiences in your life because you're not alone in those. And if you can offer up a hard experience in service of others who are having a similar experience, you've redeemed that experience. You've made meaning of it. And so there are all kinds of questions. What do I put into our political arena these days? My anger, my resentment about how stupid some people are, that's part of me. Or do I put out, do I process all of that in a way that takes me to some kind of fellow feeling? Um, I've done stupid stuff too. Uh, maybe I can find something in that that allows me to connect with other people who it seems to me have detached themselves from reality. So much depends on what I put out because I'm co-creating the outer world as I go. And if I put out a lot of anger, I help co-create an angry world. If I put out a struggle to understand myself in this very com complex context, maybe I put out more understanding. But equally so, equally so, the outer world is throwing stuff back at me. And just as I have discernments to make about what I put into the outer world, I have discernments to make about how I process what the world throws back at me. I think anybody who's ever taken a public stand on behalf of some version of love, truth, and justice has had a lot of mean-spirited stuff thrown back at them. And the question becomes, how do we process that? How, how do we let that in? How do we hold that? How do we redeem that? Um, one of my deepest convictions is violence is what happens when we don't know what else to do with our suffering. And if our suffering is around the slings and arrows of outrageous fortune, which happens to every human being, a lot depends on us finding something other than violence to do with that suffering. And that loops back to Sharon and her early insight that suffering was the very place at which we need to focus our spiritual practice and her attraction to Buddhism. Every religious tradition, as far as I know, is at bottom an answer to the question, what else can we do with our suffering than to implement it in, or respond to it with violence? So this, this Mobius strip, and I'm, I'll lay it down here in just a moment, but but it's fun to share with you the Quaker PowerPoint. It's, it's as close as Quakers ever get to a PowerPoint presentation. It's cheap. It, you can make it out of a piece of paper and it, 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 you know, it doesn't have a lot of bells and whistles attached to it. So that's Quakerism 101. Um, this Mobius strip is the adult version of the wholeness of the child. And I'm traveling that Mobius strip every day of my life. And so my wholeness is a lot more complicated than that of a little kid. Because I'm traveling that Mobius strip with privilege, with an awareness of my gifts, with opportunities to serve. And I'm traveling it with my tears, uh, my struggles, my sense of inadequacy and failure, um, falling short always of my highest aspirations. I'm traveling it with a lot of stuff that I need to learn to hold 
so that at every point of exchange between inner and outer, outer and inner, I can ask myself that critical question. What do I want to put out there? Because whatever it is, it will, it will co-create at least my local reality. And how do I want to take back in what the world tosses back at me? Because whatever it is, it will help co-create me. How can I be so aware, so mindful of those points of exchange on the Mobius strip that I can on balance make decisions that are more life-giving than death dealing? To me, that's the most fundamental spiritual question of my life. And it's this is for, for me one way of thinking about what we are what we're discussing when we talk about the movement toward an undivided life and the decision to live divided no more, which again has to be made day after day after day, moment after moment. That's my story and I'm sticking to it. Parker, thank you uh, for sharing that with us. And just as a reminder for everyone uh, that's part of the conversation, you can keep sharing questions into the chat. Claire and I, Alice as well, are paying attention to what's being shared in there and we'll be coming back to Parker and Sharon uh, to uh, put those questions to them later on in the session. Uh, those questions can range on everything from an undivided life to how to do Quaker PowerPoint presentations. Um, Sharon, I'd love to invite you to just reflect on what Parker has shared. Um, it'd be lovely to hear your thoughts. Uh, well, one thought was I have to learn how to do that Mobius strip because <laughs> maybe it's a Buddhist thing, but I don't have anything usually when I present. And I go into places and they say, once I went into Google to teach and they said, where's your computer? And I said, in the car. And they said, well, don't you have like a, you know, a presentation? I said, no. It's like, yeah. but I, I just had this image of like cutting out the, the thing, you know, and it'd be really exciting. So thank you so much for that. Um, uh, I had many reflections. There were a couple of different things that came strongly to my mind. One, in terms of Parker's really beautiful point about suffering. Um, I remember being at a Buddhist Christian conference at Gethsemane Monastery, uh, which was Thomas Merton's monastery. And the Dalai Lama was there as one of the, one of the group that was presenting. And uh, there had been an exchange of monastics between the Buddhist community and the Christian community prior to this. So um, the whole beginning of the conference was kind of dreary, honestly. You know, everyone was, as they can be, excessively polite in this situation. And uh, it was a lot of lists, like we sent this many nuns to India and this many monks went from India to, you know, a Christian community. and. And it was kind of like, oh, okay, you know, it's going to be many days of this. Um, and then uh, Norman Fisher, who's a Zen teacher, got up and he is a completely guileless person. So uh, he was asking his question from a place of really wanting to know, like deeply wanting to, to understand. And what he said was, he said, you know, I look at the crucifix and I look at the symbol of Christ, the image of Christ hanging off the crucifix. And he said, I'm not inspired. You know, like, I don't, I don't understand. Uh, and I would like to understand, and he was very sincere. I would like to understand why this is inspiring to you. And all of a sudden the conversation turned to suffering and suffering that has nowhere to go and suffering that needs to be shared somehow and suffering. And all of a sudden it was like this amazing gathering of people who were speaking and, you know, some terrible experiences of, uh, you know, violence perpetrated against different communities and, and uh, hints of what Parker was talking about, that kind of silo, you know, of the gated community of a religion. And I mean, there was so much and I realized it was only that topic that could have us kind of strip away pretense and position and, you know, kind of the dignitaries of this religion and the dignitaries of that religion. And, and it was the most amazing conversation. And so I, I really want to applaud that, that possibility. And it's very hard uh, 
to be that undefended and truthful about what is a part, not the sum total, but a part of our experience that needs to be shared. And that was another reflection I had was about culture. And I, you know, I certainly don't know every, uh, I mean, you're all tuning in from all over the world and, you know, and I don't know the cultural influences that are, are part of your background, all of you. Um, I know for this country, um, you know, it is so often uh, embarrassing or it feels wrong that somehow there's a premium on being in control at all times. And uh, one of the beautiful things Parker said early on was about the wholeness in his brokenness, that you can't just have this projection of an image that's kind of perfect that is exclusive of the parts of us that hurt. And, um, and yet that's what we're encouraged to do. And I remember a woman came to see me once who'd had a terrible tragedy uh, befall her family, um, maybe six months before we were talking. And, and you know she was describing what had happened. And then she said, my friends are kind of impatient with me just sort of saying like, get over it, you know? It's been six months and believe me, this was not a six month problem. Um, and then she said, my friends all have golden lives. Nothing ever goes wrong for them. Which of course I didn't believe for a second, but that's like the pretense. My friends all have golden lives. Nothing ever goes wrong for them. So they now look at me as like this threat you know, like life gone awry and they feel uneasy around me. And then I had one of those experiences, you know, where you just hear these words come out of your mouth. So the first thing I said to her was, I think you need new friends. And then I said to her, you should meet my friends. They're all a wreck. So I have many friends I can see on, on this call. So I apologize to all of you. It's not that you're really a wreck, but there can be a kind of forthrightness, which is a relief for everybody to say, this is a part of life and, and we share this. And, uh, and also listening to Parker, I thought, well, we have to do our best to create a culture around us, you know, in, in a sense of community where, where this is okay, where this is a part of things. Thank you, Sharon. Um, so through the arc of this journey over the next few months, the next many months, uh, we're going to be exploring with you different aspects of the inner journey from the inside all the way out to how we relate to the world. And we'll be exploring different ways of engaging with our inner selves. And this really touches on what Parker was talking about, the movement towards an undivided life. And at the same time, discerning what can support us best or discerning what we're looking for, uh, rather, um, and what we need is a really, really important piece that you both have underlined. What can help us connect with this? This, this being the discernment piece, Aaron? Yes. Mm -hmm. Well, um, I'll, uh, first of all, thank you, Sharon, for, for what you just said. Um, I, I'm looking forward to going to hell because that's where all my friends are. So in my own religious tradition, uh, we're going to party on where, you know, that, that'll be, that's a good place. Um, I do not want to be taken in the rapture, definitely. And I've, yeah, I've filed a petition on that. Um, so discernment, it seems to me, um, has two very important poles. Um, and these have been very active uh, pieces of the puzzle in, in my life. Um, the, the first one is solitude, um, whether that's done in the form of moments during the day when you're alone with yourself and just letting those thoughts roll through and trying not to get attached to them, or whatever form of contemplation, meditation, prayer you practice. I think that kind of going inward on the Mobius strip in order to go back out there in a um, clearer 
a more insightful way, a, a more grounded way is, is just a critical component. And sometimes for me, that's taken the place, taken the form of a 10 day uh, solitary retreat in the deserts of New Mexico or a weekend retreat in, the, in a cabin in the woods. But those are rare opportunities. And for me, it's, it's more often being alone with the alone at home in my own work. Writing is for me a form of solitude um, that's deeply reflective. But what I've had to come to terms to with is the fact that um, I, I won't speak for anyone else here, but I don't think I'm alone in this. I'm, I'm capable of infinite degrees of self-deception uh, about, about my North Star, about what's good and true for me. And so I've always needed the other pole of community uh, to check and correct myself. And, and let me hasten to say that community doesn't need to be a big deal. I've, I've heard a lot of people say, no, I've got too much on my to-do list already. I don't want to join a group. Well, you don't have to. Community can be one or two people who know how to hold you in these moments of discernment with whom you can have a trustworthy conversation, trusting your, your own truth with them and trusting them not to invade you around your own truth. I, I think that most of our, well, put it this way, too many of our models of community are highly invasive. And that can range from friendships to religious organizations, where I tell you my problem and you listen for three minutes, if you've been to a listening workshop recently, seven minutes, and then you start giving me your advice, your counsel. You tell me that you've had exactly the same problem and here's what you did. Or you heard about a book that I ought to read or a program that I ought to sign up for. And of course, I think it's a common human experience that that just leaves us feeling unheard and unseen. And the, one of the deepest human needs, I think we'd all agree, is to be seen and heard for who we are as we are without somebody trying to turn us into something different um, through, through means that might work for them, although they probably haven't really, but are very unlikely to work for me because I'm not you and we can't really get inside each other. So there has to be a way of holding. I think it was actually first suggested to me when I was reading uh, Rainer Maria Rilke, and he has this definition of love. Love is this, that two solitudes border, protect, and salute one another. Two solitudes border, protect, and salute one another. And I thought, that's a definition of love that works for me because that's about attentiveness. That's about listening. That's about honoring. That's about the deep bow to the mystery of another soul. And the question then becomes, how do we evoke that without invading it? Um, and so in the work I've done over the years, which I wrote about in a, in a book called A Hidden Wholeness, um, that's meant forming circles of trust, as, as we call them, in which there is a basic ground rule. No fixing, no saving, no advising, no correcting each other. So the ground rule from the get-go in, in this form of community, whether it's one or two people or a larger group, says no, you, you cannot do the things we most like to do because they are the things that are most likely to shut down the other person's soul, the other person's inner teacher. And so we will avoid those at all costs. What you can do, however, is to listen carefully enough to ask an honest, open question. The kind of question, and I hear quote Nell Morton, that is capable of hearing another person into deeper speech. 
Um, <clears throat> so an honest open question is one you ask without possibly being no, uh, thinking, I know the right answer to this and I hope you give it to me. If you, if, you, if you heard the other person say, I was very angry about that, what did you mean by anger? And where was that coming from? Uh, would be an honest open question. Um, but have you thought about seeing a therapist is not an honest open question. That's a piece of advice in disguise. And so there's a lot to be said, we don't have time for it here, but about ways of holding each other in a space where the point is not for two people to have a conversation, but for one person to have a deepening conversation with herself or himself. There, there are all kinds of ways to do that. And the results can be pretty astonishing because, and I'll lay it down here, there's a truth that our culture denies that is on which these practices are premised. And that is that everybody has an inner teacher, which if attended to, and if sorted and sifted in community, the way I just described, is the best teacher we've got. So it's, it's not solipsism, it's not strictly like, okay, what am I thinking about this today? That must be true. It's tested in relationship. It sorts and sifts itself over a long period of time. And you learn to listen to yourself at deeper levels because somebody is helping you to do that. Um, I think for me, that's what discernment, Aaron, is, is most fundamentally about. Thank you, Parker. Um, Sharon, would love to hear if there are any top of mind reflections there. And then we have incredible questions coming in from folks on the call. So please keep them coming and we'll, we'd love to work through those next. Um, over to you, Sharon. Okay. Uh, thank you, Parker. It was, that was really wonderful. You actually brought to mind this um, incredible quotation I have. I have two quotations here from the late theologian Howard Thurman, who's one of my favorite authors. Uh, one, he said, um, there's something in every one of you that waits and listens for the sound of the genuine in yourself it is the only true guide you will ever have. And if you cannot hear it, you will all of your life spend your days on the ends of strings that somebody else pulls. And then he said, um, don't ask yourself what the world needs. Ask yourself what makes you come alive and go do that. Because what the world needs is people who have come alive. You know, so I'm, I'm ever grateful to my uh, meditation practice because it's one of the places in which I've been able to have more discernment. You know, when we talk about something like doubt, for example, uh, there are ways that doubt can be seen as very important. Like why be gullible? You know, why just take something for granted? Why carry on with every assumption that comes up in your mind as though it were necessarily true. A lot of them are not true. You know, the ways we see one another, the assumptions we make about what we're capable of, um, what the world needs to look like, things like that. Uh, so it's good to question and wonder and have that kind of space to, um, in a way, deconstruct something. There's another kind of doubt, which is just cynicism. And it often is actually a form of fear. You know, we're afraid we will fail. We're afraid we can't accomplish something. So uh, it manifests as it's not worth trying. And that's a stupid thing to do. Um, and so it's through mindfulness that I've been able to, you know, at least to a much greater extent, see the difference. They feel different. And we use sensation in the body, which is a way of... Um, picking up what may be accompanying a particular thought pattern. And it, it guides us to, to some recognition and some realization. Am I coming from a place of fear? Uh, is this more like a, a pretty reasonable stance of like, I can't make a decision right now, or I don't know if I wanna participate. Let me, let me look at things. It's good to question and it's good to feel the the power of one's own ability to make choices in this way. 
On the other hand, we tend to have a great deal of conditioning around our own limits, around other people, around being alone and unsupported. And um, these things really, I think we, we need to use our, our awareness and the light of our awareness to really see maybe just one layer underneath what is feeding that. And then, and then we have the ability to, to make a choice and, and say, well, do I want to be governed by this fear or do I want to take a step? And, and Parker, I think is completely correct in that uh, very often we need more than just our own ability to pick up difference. We need some a greater group and it could be one other person um, truly, and, and uh, to have a kind of agreement of seeing vulnerability as honesty or truthfulness and being able to express that in some way. Thank you, Sharon. Um, starting to look at our questions here, the first one is for you, Sharon. Um, how do you, do you still have yearning in your life and how, how do you um, keep that alive as you're balancing all of these other elements? Um, I think I would say, yes, I do. I still have yearning in my life. I'm older also, you know, so uh, there's a certain perspective that comes, I would say with, uh, it's all right, you know, I've, um, I've written 11 books for God's sake, you know, like uh, it, it's, it's a lot already. I don't need to, you know, wake up and think, what am I, what am I going to be able to do? Um, the the kind of yearning I have is for uh, a, as much seamlessness as I can have in my life as possible, both the inner and outer that Parker was talking about, and um, kind of the small and the big. You know, we all want, I think, a, a fair amount of impact, and it's easy to overlook the single conversation with somebody or just thanking somebody who's played a service, you know, played out some role in our life where they're in service to us, the checkout person in the supermarket. And, um, it's very easy, I find, to get uh, lost in kind of the immensity of, of both the suffering and the possibility. And uh, I want my life to be seamless. I really yearn for that. So that uh, inner and outer and small and large and all of it, feels at one and also my in, inner practice and its outer manifestation. So I do the best I can. And, uh, you know, some of you in previous calls have heard me say that given that I am not traveling so much anymore or at all, <laughs> actually, um, I am trying to look at the small, relatively smaller things like the email I just wrote before I press send and all in the light of kindness, and which is my North Star. And, and to see how uh, in all the interactions of my day, I might be able to bring some more of that forth. Thank you, Sharon. So another question from the group, uh, reflecting on suffering and sharing that. How can we reduce the fear of being hurt by others? as soon as we present our true self to the outside world? Well, all, you know, all of these are questions that I basically want to answer with, how should I know, you know, just like, <laughs> these are all journey questions, right? They're all, they're all questions to be lived into rather than to be answered. And so I think I, I, would, I would start with that. Um, you know, for me, the honest answer is that it's been a long journey uh, from defining myself um, primarily by what I thought other people thought of me to defining myself by what I think of myself. And, at, you know, that's one of the points at which I want to say to myself, well, welcome to the human race, Parker. Uh, you know, <laughs> what you just said about yourself does not make you special. Uh, that's, that's a long journey for most people from being defined by others for allowing yourself to be defined by others to being defined by yourself. Um, I, I rest very much in the mystery of the self, which I will never fully understand in myself. Um, 
Yeah, I think self-knowledge is just is harder than subatomic physics uh, in terms of conceptuality and and uh, data and evidence and proof. Uh, you, it, you just can't get there. And so um, I cut other people a lot of slack for not understanding me. You know, I, I don't ask to be understood because I barely understand myself. The, the best I can do is to put out there in, in my writing and in my teaching things I know to be true about myself, especially about my struggles, about my suffering, to go back to that word, because this is a world full of struggles and suffering. And I, I have had, as some of you know, I've, because I've written about it, uh, three deep dives into clinical depression, where for eight, 10 months at a time, I wondered if on three separate occasions, if, if this would be the day that life became no longer worth living. And I know how many people out there struggle with that very question um, and how many are trying to stand by them. And so when you have an experience like that, that seems inherently meaningless while you're having it, it's an experience of annihilation and sort of self-annihilation and what possible meaning could there be in that? Um, offering it up to other people as, as a possible source of connection, mutuality, understanding, even reassurance, um, you know, proves, uh, redeems the experience for me. And in that sense is therapeutic for me. Whenever I've written or spoken about it, which it took me 10 years to do because I wanted to make sure the experience was fully integrated into me before I went public with it. Um, whenever I, I write or speak about it, I feel more whole. I, I feel like, okay, now, now I, am, I have taken another step toward being in the world as I really am. I, I think this is all hooked with some very fundamental human yearning. And, and two that I'm very aware of is I want to feel, I yearn to feel at home in my own skin, what human being doesn't. And I yearn to feel at home in this very diverse and complicated world in which we live, what human being doesn't. Now, some people try to cover up those yearnings. They don't, they don't even want to acknowledge yearnings. They cover them up with bluster, bravado, wealth, power poorly used, used even to evil ends. But underneath all that is this human yearning. And my job is, is, is first of all, to feel as deeply at home in my own skin and on the face of this diverse earth as I possibly can, because if I don't, I'm not going to serve well. And Every time I've written or spoken about depression, I take another step toward feeling a little more at home. They can take it or leave it, but I know who I am. I know where I am on this count. And I have now showed up with my own truth around this particular issue. And I, I try to do it in a way that is of service to others rather than just blowing my own horn. And, and I'll tell you this, that after, I don't know, the millions of words I've written and published, um, the, the, I get the most feedback, and I, not a, about democracy or education or spirituality or community or leadership, I get it about depression not only the most feedback, but the most deeply human connections. And so that's a form of community that just nurtures me deeply to, to, to know and to be known at that level. And one more thing that I always have to add now as I approach age 82, I can't imagine a sadder way to die than with the sense that I never managed to, to show up in this world 
as my true self or, or even an approximation of my true self despite 80 plus years of taking up space. I can't imagine, I can imagine painful ways to die. I can't imagine a sadder way to die than to be, have to say, I blew it. And when I look at it that way, as, as Leibniz said, sub specii eternitatis, under the aspect of eternity, um, it's a no-brainer. Like we, we don't really get the chance to say like, do over, you know? <laughs> like, yeah, right. I think, let's start again. Uh, although maybe we do, who knows? Um, <laughs> But I, I totally agree. I've had the same experience with my book, Faith, which was really about my faith journey. It's the most autobiographical and revealing book I've written. And, and it was hard to write. And at the same time, I get more comments from people who read that than anything. And uh, I appreciate the effort I put into writing it and how difficult it was. And I'm just so glad. Um, it, it also reminds me, Parker, what you say of uh, how important I have found it to, you know, going back to what I was saying before earlier, just keep an eye on how things make me feel, you know, because we have, we tend to have so many myths that we've been offered and so many distortions and so many kind of strange perceptions about life and, and how we'll be happy that it takes a, a good degree of awareness to notice like, oh, uh, being bent on vengefulness is not that great feeling, actually, you know, or um, compassion doesn't make me sort of weak and ineffectual after all. And it's, it's through that lens that both through our internal assessment and if we have some uh, community, you know, even one other person where we're assessing, but that's really the key for me is is being able to be in touch with how things actually are affecting me. Thank you both. Uh, building on that, another question is, um, I at times feel others may understand me better than I understand myself. What is this? A lack of confidence or perhaps I've not tried to understand who I am? I mean, I'd say welcome to the human race. <laughs> yeah, really, I like that. <laughs> That's the first thing I want to say. I think that's the word we ought to say to each other all the time. Um, whatever you're struggling with, um, you're not struggling alone. Um, and again, I don't know the answer to it. I, I, think, I, I think what I would do is, uh, and have had to do in my life is consider the source um, and consider what their self-interest may be in defining you or understanding you in a, in a certain way. Um, and there are all kinds of twists and turns there. You know, I've had, I had the experience of teaching in Appalachia one year at, at Berea College in Berea, Kentucky, with kids who basically come from a third world in the United States. And I was teaching a class on vocational discernment and I, I genuinely saw in these young people more than they saw in themselves. Because I was looking at a young woman, for example, who had been helping to raise a family of six ever since she was eight years old because dad was an alcoholic and couldn't hold a job and mom had three jobs that didn't allow her to be at home living in a holler. And this young woman had, had made her way to college. And, and that's a journey I never could have taken at her age or probably any age. I had so much support for the journey that I was on. So I was in this vocational discernment course, I was trying to help some of these students, including this young woman see the gifts in themselves that they couldn't see. I thought that's what teachers were supposed to do, and I still do, but I learned a biggie. This young woman became visibly more agitated with me and more withdrawn from me. And I asked her one time when we were 
alone in, in the corner of a coffee shop, other people around, but nobody could hear our conversation. I, I said, something, something's wrong. I think I'm doing something wrong. Help me understand what it is. And she said, well, you're not, she basically said, I can't quote her exactly on this, but she basically said, you're not from around here. I was raised by parents and a minister whose constant teaching was don't get above your raisin. Don't get above your raising. Don't think more of yourself than you should. Does that ring bells with anybody? The, the, the big fear of parents who delivered their kids to Berea College from the hollers of Appalachia was that they would get above their raising and start thinking too much of themselves and, and take a, get an education and take on jobs that would take them out of the community and make them judgmental of their ancestors and their heritage. And so I was challenging a core belief of hers by affirming her gifts. And it, and it really has taken me a long time to find my way through the twists and turns. When you want to bless another person with your knowledge that you could never have done what they did. And yet that blessing turns out to be a curse, at least in the moment for that young person. How do you hold that space in an educative, evocative way? Um, then that's an ongoing journey for me. I, it's just all of this is ongoing journey. So she was considering the source to loop back to my original point. So she was saying, well, here's a guy from the, the rich North who has a degree that I'll never get and a job I'll never get who's trying to make me into something I'm not. That's a big one to untangle. But other, other people in our lives are sometimes in defining us are, are, are pushing us beyond where we're ready to go in this moment, which is another way to look at the case of this young woman, because eventually I was just there for a year, so I wasn't an ongoing influence in her life, but eventually she grew into something that I think probably surprised even her, but she obviously got some help from people who weren't me. So when I say consider the source, what are, what are the motives of the people who are telling you something that you don't see about yourself? Maybe they're benign, maybe they're not, but it's at least a way of taking another angle on the issue. Thank you, Parker. So we're gonna try and bring in one more question, but what I wanna say first before that question is, uh, we really, really appreciate all the questions that have been so beautifully shared by everyone in the chat. And so our commitment through this series is that all the questions will be taken back to Parker and to Sharon uh, we'll be doing this uh, live. I, I was going to make a joke about sending these to you by post. Um, and we'll be coming back with written answers or even video answers on the questions that are there. So just know uh, we really will be making a practice out of honoring the questions um, that people are sharing into the chat. Um, and so that takes us to our last question uh, today uh, before we come to wrapping up. And there's a question that's had a little bit of energy in the chat, so we'll bring ourselves to a close with that. Uh, and Sharon, I'm going to direct this question to you. I suffer feeling lost with my loved ones, bouncing between, am I behaving super egocentrically and selfishly? And am I forgetting about myself? And am I not caring for what brings me alive? I can create 1,000 different narratives, distorting reality, and all can make sense to me. How do I find clarity in these situations? Is it here where community can support? Well, first I'll say, strangely enough, I have also taught in Berea, Kentucky. <laughs> um, I never really thought of that as Appalachia, but of course it is. Uh, I was teaching at the Bell Hooks Institute, which is part of the university there. And 
it was there that somebody uh, I was talking about, she and I were talking about um, the stories others tell about us, about who we are and how those are the stories we need to look at uh, to see if they strike us as true or not. And certainly a, a family is a rich source of such stories, but somebody in the group raised their hand and said, I don't think others tell stories about us. They don't know us. How could they be telling stories about us? And I responded by saying, everything tells a story about us. Architecture tells a story about us. You know, if you're in a wheelchair and, and you need to go through some convoluted entrance to get into a building, that is telling a story about you and whether you belong or not. And so I, I think that is part of it is realizing this is inevitable, that there are many stories that are woven uh, about who we are. And here's a place for mindfulness, for discernment. And I don't think, you know, uh, when I was reading the question, I don't think it's that we're gonna come to a kind of clarity that's gonna hold in all situations. And, and we can say, oh, now I've got it. I think it's, it's more, it's both baby steps. It's, and I'd say paying attention to um, first one's motivation or intention. When you say no to something, or when you say, I can't do that right now, I'll have to do it later. Or when you say yes to something, or when you're generous, um, just pivot a little bit and pay some attention to what, what is sparking your response, because that's revealing. And only you will actually know. People may make assumptions about it, but only you will actually know. Are you trying to be a hero? Uh, are you feeling they won't love me if I ever say no? Are you panicking? Um, or are you feeling some sense of uh, wherewithal inside and, and you don't sense that you're gonna be depleted by spending time with somebody uh, in the sense of not having any energy at all. Um, you know, and pay attention to your motivation because we never do actually in general. It's not a, a significant part of our consideration. Pay attention to being as skillful as you can in communication. And this is a whole learning all in and of itself. And even though I found things like the advice to use I language, you know, and not you language or especially not accusatory you language kind of formulaic and I think all right you know like use my language it actually makes a difference um I have found so it's like if you back in the old days when we went to the movies with people uh if you walk out of the theater with a friend and they say that was the best movie ever made there's now not enough room in the universe for you to say I didn't like it that much they have laid out absolute truth. And if they, in contrast, say, I really love the movie, you could say, well, I had some problems with it. And then some real communication can happen. It may not be coming from your family members, but it can come from you. Um, you know, and, and to understand that being accusatory, uh, being the repository of what is completely true at all times for all people it's just not gonna foster communication. And so it's the intention and it's the skillfulness of, of the action. And, and beyond that, just pay attention, you know? And that is where integrity is said to lie within the Buddhist tradition, because we certainly hope for a good response. We hope for people to thank us, um, things like that, but we actually can't insist. We just don't have that kind of control over the universe. And, you can't expect somebody to come into a situation with nothing going on for them at all, you know, a completely blank slate. And so when we try to understand the integrity of our action, even though it's hurtful, of course, not to have a great impact, uh, we come back to look at our intention and we look at the skillfulness of our action. And, and there is a certain amount of letting go of the rest. I just want to add, since we're doing interreligious dialogue here, that the Quaker response <clears throat> to that's the best movie I've ever seen would be that thought would not have occurred to me. Thank you, Parker. Thank you, Sharon. Uh, and in a way, this also acts as a bit of a bridge to the sessions to come because many of like the layers that you touched on here set the stage for what we'll be exploring um, over the next many months. 
Um, so we're just going to do a tiny little bit to wrap up, just framing things for the next session and, and the arc of uh, the series. The first is just to say uh, this journey uh, through to uh, October is one that's meant to really build uh, over time. So we really encourage people to come for each of the sessions. Um, there's also pre-reads and home play um, on both ends of the sessions. Um, and so it allows uh, all of us to go a little bit deeper into what's being shared uh, by Parker and Sharon and the wonderful guests that will be joining us uh, over these months. Um, and then uh, one question that we have for the group is whether it might make sense to host a cafe style conversation amongst people from this group more generally who want to explore a bit more into topics that have come up. Uh, we're considering opening up a space for that once a month hosted by the wonderful and extraordinary Dean of our inner work programs, Nancy Mortify. Um, and so we'll share a link into the chat. And if you're interested, please do sign up. It'll give us a sense for whether uh, there's interest around this piece. And then Alice, I wonder if um, I could ask you to share uh, your screen just for the next session, just so we can give a tiny bit of a preview uh, of what's to come. So our next session is Somatic Awareness Through Movement. We'll be joined by two wonderful speakers, um, Reggie Hubbard and Itzel Hayward. Sharon and Parker will actually have the interview, interviewer hat on. Um, and then we'll be sharing their reflections on what's shared by the two of them. This session, again, will be an hour and a half. Um, and we're feeling very excited about this because this really starts to take us back into our bodies and starting from there uh, outwards. And with that, I think we can bring ourselves to a close for today. Um, and what I'd love to do is just say thank you uh, to Alice and to Erica and to Robin, who have just been absolutely amazing in helping us put all of this together. Also, thank you to Claire. Um, it's super, super nice to be able to co-host this uh, with Claire. To Nancy Mortify, who has put together um, the arc for this uh, series. And then, of course, to Parker and to Sharon uh, for taking us on this journey. And so just as we close out, what we'd love to invite is just we've, we've all been on this call now for an hour and a half. We can take uh, maybe turn our cameras on. And um, as we check out, just say uh, thank you to uh, the group and also to Parker and Sharon uh, for the time that we've had together today. Thank you, everyone. Thank, Thank you. you. Thank, Thank you, you so much. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks, everybody. Thank Beautiful. Thank everybody. Thank you so much. Sasha. Bye. 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 Bye.